All right, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Doom Drop Podcast. I'm here with Shun. We're chilling. We're hanging out. We actually talked for like 45 minutes before we even pressed record. <laughs> it is what it yeah, is. We we're just chilling, talking about some controversial shit. Now we're going to yep. get onto the podcast. Let's talk about something a little bit more uplifting here, Shun. Um, I have a comment here. It was from Major Mike. He commented on our last semifinals episode. He said, a real sausage pile here, saying, in quotes, Shun is so eloquent <laughs> and creative and random. Your thoughts? Uh, it's actually taken me aback <laughs> a little bit. It's actually probably one of the nicer comments I've heard. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> um, I'm a sausage monkey through and through, and I, I think you're aware of my style. I'll even like deliberately um say some random ish mid cast because i just can't contain myself like i'm doing a super <laughs> serious cast i'm analyzing the game and all of a sudden i've got to throw in some like loose analogy that only like one percent of the audience will probably even pick up on sometimes i can feel it coming like uh i'll be <laughs> finished saying something and then i'll i'll hear like the tone of your voice i'm like oh shit he's about to say something <laughs> fucking weird <laughs> I can't help it. I, I, it's, it's almost like a release valve, you know. I mean, to be able to be super serious for the other like ninety-five percent of the time and really dialed in to what they're doing and psychoanalyzing the situation or whatever, like yeah, like I have to have a little bit of like schoolboy glee from time to time. You know what I mean? A lot of people do appreciate it. Um, some people said, uh, "Scurf, Scurf NTX." He said, "I will admit, I don't always get Shun's analogies." <laughs> <laughs> and i think that's by design isn't it yeah that's by design but the point is is that you might not get all of them but you might get like one out of 10 or one out of 50 you know what mm -hmm. i mean right and that's the point is that i only want a tiny amount of people to even know what the f i'm going on about yeah that's that's part of the fun of it i think the the sausage party one was uh about the marines moving out without a, a medic you really went off on that one i think <laughs> yeah uh, it's, it's a trope that i don't think has been touched upon enough and it does seem to be like a trend in terran players where they never quite have the ratio of marines and medics down you know what i mean mm -hmm. well, that's tough that's that's a tough ratio yeah. to get right you got too many medics you're pretty worthless um too yep. many marines is just not gonna sustain well but uh medics are just so dumb they're always wandering around in the wrong spot and getting picked <laughs> off you almost have to make yeah. a couple of extra just to make sure that you have enough. Yeah, and also they don't move as fast as the Marines or Stims, so they can be hard to keep alive as well. But mm -hmm. there are some situations where you want to have a, a big clump of them and they're all dumb and standing in the way, like against Crazy Zerg, for example, having that like Salvation Army style, like just big line of medics like body blocking against the Ultras actually can be crazy strong. <laughs> Salvation Army style? I don't <laughs> There's one of those references. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. And just just so you know, that reference is so niche. It's in a Pimpus Play video from like 2004, 2005 or something. And there's a, a scene on Luna the Final where Nada is in the bottom left playing as Terran and he's really far behind. He's playing up against a Zerg and he makes a big long line of medics to kind of body block and he actually somehow manages to make a comeback. These references are like really niche and I just can't help myself. <laughs> That does sound very niche. Um, I'm not sure which game it's you're talking Salvation about. Army. Salvation yeah, the, Army. And in, the, in, and in the music video, they called it the Nada's Salvation Army or something. That's why I made that reference, yeah. Gotcha, because it saves them. I was thinking about the actual Salvation Army, but it's because it saved the game for Nada. I gotcha. Yeah, okay. yeah see? These, so, so some of these references are like red herrings as well. Like you think, even if you think mm. you know what I'm on about, you still might not. Right. I see. Pimpus Place, man. That needs to come back. I, I think I might might need to make that like kcm pimpus plays or something like that oh we should we so should and we've had such crazy high quality games like mm. we there's some times where we'll cast like a week and we're like oh wow that was a good week and then the next week will be like oh that was an even better week and it somehow even sometimes gets progressively better which is mm -hmm. kind of insane to think about yeah i've had some people when i thought like a, we had a great week and then some people are you know complaining about it like maybe I'm just like seeing things differently. Um, no, but a lot of people have biases as well. Like, say their favorite players weren't showing up, or their race is getting 
you know pooed on or whatever like say they're like really diehard Protoss fans and like minis throwing games and like yeah the, mm. Yeah, and there's like, and and they don't get to see, they get they see the TVZ semifinals. So Protoss didn't even play. So like, all the Protoss fans are like, "What the fuck?" You know, like, "Come on, I want to see a Protoss game." You know, sometimes <laughs> you get weird angles from people like that, where it's more their biases that are trickling through into why they did or didn't like a certain week. Right. Or, some some yeah. people only like to see like late game as well. Some people only like to see like long yeah. drawn out battle back and forth, but. Mm -hmm. There's there's some beauty to like uh, really early game, uh, crazy early game I fights so. and like really scrappy games is what I like to see where there's a lot of action going on. I'm not filling a lot of time like waiting for something to happen. You know, those are the ones yeah. that I like the best. Yeah, I like the high octane tempo swing early to mid game games where you don't even know who's gonna win mm -hmm. and um, or or expect that kind of game to begin with. I love it when you we as the casters are surprised like even though it's our job to analyze the game and be like i think he's thinking this and i think he's gonna do this because that makes sense based on the, the spawning positions on this particular map we that's our job to do that even so i like it when i'm wrong i love mm. it when i'm wrong and i'm surprised and then i've got something weird situation i have to reassess right yeah there's some um, there's a beauty to those games where things get so scrappy in the early game and you know that both players, their timings have been completely thrown off, but they're still mm. able to hit like moments, you know, they're still able right. to do things that like you wouldn't even think of like, Oh, I can, st I could still hit this before uh t mm. storm timing. Do you know what I mean? He probably doesn't have storm yeah. yet, even though it's like way later than he should have storm uh, in a normal game. It's like, everything's been figured out um yeah they've mapped out the relative mm -hmm. timings that they still need to hit which yeah. is kind of crazy to That's think wild. about like in their mind that they've got the game that mapped out yeah and they know they've got this amount of gas based on this amount of time to work with and they can like refine all the builds they don't need to like most people on the ladder for example like you and me mm -hmm. we've got the build orders kind of mapped out in our brain like we know we do this at this time but not relative to say losing a two drones at the start and like mm -hmm. losing some mining time and like things get like pushed back 40 seconds relative right. timing wise or something yeah. we're not good at doing those adjustments mm -hmm. and these players are they they're able to like navigate such bizarre scenarios and it's kind of fascinating to watch because I can't even imagine like the cerebral capacity and power you need to have to like figure out the puzzle on the fly like that. Yeah, yeah, it's it's so impressive. It's uh, it makes it that much more fun to cast a game like that when you know that all the timings have been thrown off and they're just flying by the seat of their pants, like figuring out what needs mm. to be done at what time. And you're like, geez, these guys are just they're just amazing. They're just so yeah. good. It uh, it really shows in those games, especially. Um, one thing, that, or one person I've been watching a lot recently, talking about StarCraft Pros, is uh, this this new player called uh, Quickly. Have you seen any of his games yet? Uh, I don't think so. Quickly. Yeah, I've been casting a bunch of his games lately. Um, for my replay. Uh, series. One or two actually. And, I mean, he's just killing it, dude. He is just crushing, like. Um, yeah. Big name players like I think he beat Hero. He definitely beat Rush. Like he's been just smashing people uh, on the ladder, and it's just super impressive the way that he plays. Um, I, I think that we might be seeing him if he can get over. I know there's at least like the first couple of seasons of uh, playing in offline tournaments is is really really rough. But if he can keep this type of performance, I think that he could be like a another contender you know one of those like mini best um bisu snow level players in the future it's really impressive to see i've never seen his pvp but his pvt yeah. pvz is really really good it's crazy well yeah you do tend to get these people that they come they rise f it's, it's a very brutal process getting to the level where you're able to like dominate some pro gamers even just online not offline because mm -hmm. that they, they, they the pro gamers will figure you out very quickly once you've established yourself as being even capable at playing at that level and they will dismantle you easily for quite some time so yeah. you'll be playing at a sub 50 percent win rate against that caliber of player for a very long time and that's the way it's always been even back in the days of Gur, like the one of the original um uh, non-korean pro gamers 
um Petri, or whatever his name was, um Guillaume Petri. Um he had like 30% win rate for a very long time against mm. these pro gamers. And he was struggling. Like, and it's, it's always been like that. Mm-hmm. But when you do finally start to rise from the ashes like a phoenix and can actually start to hang with these guys like that it's kind of impressive but like you say the issue is then the the offline nerves because the reason why players like light are so scary it's not because they execute their builds well and have good micro or macro or whatever it's because they've got so much experience of doing this so that they're they're as cool as cucumbers so even if they're on stage with a a big crowd with loads of flashing lights and it's like for their tournament life they're still fucking calm and collected and playing their a game and that's why they're so special and and you can't really get that in any other way than actually just doing it and showing up to a few asls and getting good enough that you can like you know smash through the qualifiers and still get some stage time that's hard enough itself just to make it into asl Mm -hmm. and then actually get some offline you know experience so it's a big barrier to entry and that's why starcraft is such like one of the most impressive zero-sum games that we've got yeah i sometimes get like shaky and freaking nervous just playing on ladder man i'm sure other people yeah. have that experience too but i just can't imagine playing on a stage trying to keep your heart rate down and like breathe while playing just it yeah blows my mind um well, yeah. i've had situations where back when i was playing starcraft 2 i was playing that semi-competitively i was doing pretty good i was a top masters zerg that was like gm mmr level like i'd be matched up against gms on the ladder i was mm-hmm. actually pretty good in starcraft 2 and i went to a, a lan event and um I've, I've been to lan events before for like fps games I've, I've loved playing lands as a kid like having quake lands and counter-strike lands and all that kind of stuff mm-hmm. that wasn't as nerve-wracking but at this particular lan because I was the uh, one of the only people at this particular land that was like actually pretty good at the game in terms of my speed at playing it, I actually drew a crowd of people around me at one point. I had like a semicircle of people standing around me watching me play. Mm-hmm. And I have to say, like I could not play anywhere near my usual ability. Like it was nerve wracking having an, an audience of people just standing around you watching you. Right. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah, much respect to people who can pull that off um maybe that's like you said why light is so well respected is just his calm cool demeanor um yeah and back in pro league days he was all killing teams you know what i mean yeah like he he was like the only person that needed to play for his team he just come out and smash everyone and they'd be like okay day's over and go back home now yeah that's crazy really impressive stuff um i hope that quickly continues to improve i think Protoss could use another like really strong player. We've got so many good Terrans right now, so many good Zerg players. Um, I've been casting some Soma as well. By the way, he's uh playing on ladder right now. He's not out of the military yet, but right. putting up some good games on ladder, which is fun to watch. Well, back in um Pro League days, Air Force Ace, I think they were allowed about four hours of practice a day on average roughly mm. so they were allowed a little bit of wiggle room to, to practice in their own time while oh. they were in the military so maybe there's some similar thing going on right now where soma's getting a, you know a bit of game time despite still serving i figured he was like done with the um basic training and he's now just you know working an office job for military for the military yeah. so he has his off time in the afternoons well, then he should stuff. have a fair amount. Yeah, then he should have a fair allotment to be able to do that. Yeah, I figure that's probably what he's at. Is. Yeah, and um, that makes sense. I mean, he sh- he should stay at a, a high level because he's still very young. You know, he's like mm-hmm. uh, at the beginning of his career. Really, still has a long, a long illustrious career ahead of him. I'm sure he's still top, top, top tier. But um. Yeah, he should be able to knock the rust off pretty quickly. It's fun to see him. Uh, Mackering yeah. still at such a high level. He, he played a game yesterday. I, I casted it. It was like, you know, he's spamming like 470 APM and he, he built two overlords at the beginning of the game. Like, oh man. <laughs> it, it, it goes away fast. You sure lose your touch quickly when you're, uh, yeah, it, you're away for just a little bit. It's a weird thing with StarCraft because the game's so janky and like 
even just the raw input of the game feels a little off unless you play it all the time like mm-hmm. you have to really like, as soon as you stop playing it for like a week or two weeks like even just how the game feels and how you move your mouse around and how the how everything feels in the game can just feel off to you right mm. unless you're it's like it's like you have to exist in the matrix to even be able to read the matrix and as soon as you stop existing in that world you you lose your ability to read the matrix code you have to like realign yourself yeah um switching gears here uh away from starcraft i remember we talked a little bit about um there's a like a tiktok sensation or like a instagram live sensation guy who was oh yeah doing uh, gasoline um trying to change plastic into gasoline did oh you, no i think i think it's something different oh, okay i'm thinking i thought you were going to talk about the guy that um got arrested recently oh, um, was that? you tell he, me about this first i'll tell you about this uh this gasoline uh, it's, just, guy it's a guy that will it's a guy that um basically had an angry audience and he was sending out lots of threats like he got like eight federal charges of threats because he was like you know literally screaming i'm gonna bomb you and kill you and that kind of type thing was this in britain or what no i don't think so i think i think it was american Mm -hmm. but i can't remember the exact details on it but yeah that's what you were going to refer reference just now that's something that just recently developed I was just going to talk about this guy who was uh, in his backyard making some like plastic to fuel reactor where he's using micro waves to melt down plastic and make gasoline. Yeah. Anyway, he uh, he was in the hospital recently or this week because um, fumes his well, his machine was working fine, but I guess he has a distillery for the. Uh, like residue, you know, whatever comes out of that mm. um, system that he built, he has to, of course, like separate it into the different elements to get right. gasoline or whatever out of the diesel um, that comes out. And he didn't like have it under enough pressure or something like that. And when he oh, opened, shit. when he opened the distillery, um, no. it just like exploded and burned the shit out of his legs and his feet oh, so man yeah it it looks really bad it, it's it's funny it's Fuck, like sounds it's, bad. it's always the thing that's like a side part of what you're actually doing you know what i mean like he's really concentrated on the main machine yeah. which he built and then like the side thing that's like not really that important um and it's not breakthrough at all it's just a just a casual distillery and it's like not on his that's radar his totally failure, that's yeah. his point of failure yeah, yeah. so at least he's still alive at least but um oh i i looked up um before his accident i was going to tell you about this before his accident he um released like the amount of gasoline that he was able to get out of uh the plastic and how much energy it took to get the gasoline so I was able mm. to calculate uh, how much energy it would take to get the amount of gasoline that he got. And yeah. it's like the gasoline that he can get would create about a, th- a two-thirds of the amount of energy that it requires to process that amount of plastic. So he's actually running at a deficit of about a third. So uh, I, yeah. I, I, yeah. I thought that might be the case. I thought that might be the, when we talked about it originally. I, I was, <clears throat> yeah, I doubt. I, I was doubting its ability to be sustainable. Yeah, and actually, like produce a, a yield that was like superior to the investment. Right, and that's kind of what they would need to be able to do. Right, is have mm. a system that could power itself, and all you need to do is just add plastic, and you get. Hopefully, you know, you get enough gasoline to power itself and then some extra yeah. comes out of it as well. But that's just not the case, unfortunately. So uh, it, it it's like a recycling mechanism that requires more energy than you get out of it, which is, uh, you well, know, pretty speaking on that, Speaking on that with a slightly different angle, mm-hmm. like... I think recycling in general is just not what people think it is. Mm-hmm. And most of it doesn't even get recycled. The fact that you put it into a green bin and mm-hmm. like you, you, you think it gets taken to a separately 
separate places and it gets processed separately. Not always the case. Sometimes it's going to the exact same place and it's not even going to get recycled. America, for example, was selling their plastics um, to China. And then China, a few years back, was like, hang on a minute, we're going to change the deal and we're only going to accept plastic with like this level of contamination only, which is a very low level, which is basically impossible to get through domestic um, plastic without processing it yourself. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, no longer profitable to do that. So, and then the reality is, is that most companies have figured out it's actually cheaper to not recycle. You know what I mean? So there's no profit incentive to recycle. So people don't. Recycling is a scam is what he's trying to say. Yeah, basically, but they're, they're trying to make you think that they're still doing the things that they were doing a decade ago today, but they're not. They like very quietly stopped doing those things. Mm. So we all, we, they, they're trying to keep up the illusion that we're doing a good thing by separating our plastics and shit. But the reality is you're probably not. Well, at least you're not making as much of a difference as they want you to think you're making. Yeah, that's the reality. They want you to think that you're saving the planet. And but that's just a feel good thing, so you don't feel as bad about what you're doing to the planet. Using a huge amount of plastic, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. They, they want to keep people using plastic constantly. Yeah. Yeah, that's unfortunate. This kind of wraps back to what we were talking about before um, the podcast even started. Was like a lot of people will blame that on capitalism. Like, oh, that's the problem with capitalism is that. Um, you know, people will uh, take control of the system to make more money. Do you know what I mean? Like the plastic companies mm. will create a system of recycling that's just total bullshit that doesn't really recycle yeah. in order to make people feel better about using their product so that they can make more money. Um, I would say that's a failure of, of government again, right? Which is like the go government is doing all of the pla you know they they are handling the recycling system and they are seeing the result of it and then they're not telling us <laughs> you know yeah. they're they're not making it clear to everybody what's actually happening they're they're assisting the company in um you know making more money by tricking us which is well they're trick they're tricking us on so many levels. They're yeah. also tricking us. They're giving us the illusion that we're smarter than we used to be. As in, like people today, they're trying to give us the sell, sell us on the idea that people today are smarter than they used to be back before technology. And it's actually the inverse is true. Mm -hmm. We're dumber than we probably have ever been. We're just more specialized now than we've ever been. Mm -hmm. It used to be that you had to be a bit of a jack of all trades and learn a bit about everything just to get by and survive day to day in your smaller communities. And now we're hyper specialized on only coding or like you know only working in retail basically you know your, your skill sets are like more narrow than ever before right mm. more and, access uh, to information than ever before but more dumb than ever before but, it's but, uh but, and that's yeah. the thing is but but, but the acts but the information available is it's garbage in garbage out and most mm. of the information we're taking in is garbage and that's the problem is that there's so much misinformation disinformation and all kinds of bullshit out there and they want you to be as uninformed as possible. And democracy can or supposed to only be out of function with an informed populace. And we don't have that. And we don't even have direct democracy. We have representative democracy, which means the government's supposed to be there to represent the, you know, the best interests for the people. That's what's supposed to happen. But that's kind of hard for the people to make sure that happens if they don't even know what the fuck's going on. Mm -hmm. And as I was saying before, it's kind of by design that like they don't, don't want people to know what the hell's yeah, going divide on. Divide and rule, essentially. Yeah, divide and rule. Um, it's a dark topic. It gets pretty uh, messy pretty quickly when we start mm -hmm. discussing like the way that the government is manipulating us and shit. It's not a road I want to. Well, <laughs> well, we could talk about it in very broad strokes, very briefly, just so people mm -hmm. know what the fuck we're talking about, and say like what we're basically are saying is like. There is like when they talk about things like um, the American dream or they give you the they sell you on this illusion that you have like financial free financial movement, like you can move from being a working class into a middle class and, you know, re and move up the chain, so to speak. Right. But the reality is you're not really climbing ladders. You're going up and down escalators, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. It's an illusion the the, the movement and freedoms 
that they are so-called giving you, they don't actually exist. You're kind of just moving around a wheel, you know what I mean? Like a hamster in a wheel. And you don't really have the, the same kind of uh, freedoms financially that you, or economically that you would imagine you do. And they want to distract you with dividing things like think about race. That's what they want you to obsess about. Like think about these things that divide people, but not the actual dividing thing that matters more, something like class. They don't want you to think about things in those terms. They want to redirect the discussion to other things like uh, race and shit like that. Yeah, don't think about like pollution and uh don't think about like toxic in the toxic environment that's being created. Talk about um yeah, police brutality or something like that, which is just any yeah. topic that will divide people because yeah. it, it, anything that is is red red, red versus blue coke right. versus pepsi it doesn't matter it mm. really doesn't matter just as long as you can split people on it that's all that matters right and they and, and they'll create more and more of this and the more that there's going on in the world the better the more that there's think of all the divisive topics there are in the world right now mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, we could talk about all kinds of crazy shit and pretty much all of them are like have split down the middle two sides that are like completely in disagreement with each other, right? Yeah. Um, and both sides think the other side is evil because that's the yeah. way they've been portrayed. There's no free communication anymore. You can't have like nuanced discussion and be like, well, I disagree with you and you disagree with me, but let's have a talk anyway. You know what I mean? There's no mm -hmm. like thinking like that. It's like, you're the fucking bastard. You don't agree with my views, so fuck you. Mm -hmm. Try not to be like that. That's all we can do. Just try to be open to each other's ideas and be uh, responsive to yeah our, our well, the, needs the, and desires yeah and the important thing about that is you you need to have people challenging your views and mm -hmm. people with different views to talk to because that's the whole point that's how you figure this shit out how how can you figure out anything if you don't do that you're literally just living in echo chambers at that point like how can you function well how do we figure this out shun how do we how do we stop people from or how do we get people informed how is it even possible in this world it's very difficult because it's like we can't see the forests through the trees mm -hmm. you know what i mean like we're stuck in our very narrow minded worlds and we can't see the bigger picture and we're getting dumber by the day and we're focused on shorter format content more and more as well our attention spans are at all time low how we how we stop that i think we we need we need to have more balanced lives and we need to like try and push away from hedonistic thinking of like, I need to have pleasure and avoid discomfort. I think that's like number one, we need to have more balance there where we're, we're more comfortable being uncomfortable. We're more comfortable being challenged on our views or mm. we're more comfortable going out in public more, even though we'd rather just sit inside and play games or mm. whatever it is. I think just, yeah, like adjusting our balance of lives because I think this is the issue of like easy times are creating soft people and then these soft people are going to create some very hard times and these hard times are now what we need to use to shape us and to hone us into being tougher people. Yeah, I, I really do uh, resonate with what you just said about like people need to be, or not, even myself, I need to be more um, okay being dis uncomfortable in a uncomfortable situation like getting yeah. used to it because avoiding discomfort is how we get controlled you know what i mean that's how we slip into our animal programming you know what mm. i mean that's like our going down to our lower energy consciousness there it's very easy that's like it's very easy to control someone or to know what someone's gonna do just figure out what's the thing that's gonna make them the most comfortable because that's what they're gonna do and, what's and the they will sell you thing? on that What's the They'll easiest sell you thing what for you them want, to do? Not what you need. Yeah. Yeah. What's What's the easy way out? It's like um, Genghis Khan. Like you ever uh, read about like Mongolian history? It's like I know that they uh, would encircle an enemy uh, with their big 
army you know, with all our horses and then they would leave like one tiny gap it's like a hunting tactic in the in the circle because if they completely surround the enemy they'll then, fight to the death yeah they'll fight to the death but if they leave one tiny gap then yep. people who are near the gap will see that and go this is my chance to escape and they'll run for it and then everyone yeah. will start to run for the gap and they just like close up the gap slowly and just you know kill everybody as they run out and then run yeah, them down med- yeah that's medieval strategy 101 by the way you always mm-hmm. leave your enemy a golden a golden bridge of retreat always right. right or you will get a fight to last man situation and you will lose a lot more so um yeah it's uh it, it's like i said it's the easiest to predict or it's so easy to predict or to control people's actions. Like once you can predict people's actions, then you can control them. It's just, you know, setting up the most comfortable, knowing what's the, what's, what's going to make people the most comfortable. You know that they're going to choose that option. What's going to give them the most safety. You know what I mean? The most short term comfort and safety is mm-hmm. what they will usually choose. And this is the problem is that we, we trade our long term, long um ability to thrive and function for these short-term illusionary periods of security and belonging and most of it's superficial and doesn't even exist as smoke and mirrors but you're still being sold on it your Mm -hmm. rights your freedoms are slowly being eroded year to year and people they're the frogs in the water that's slowly being brought to boil and because it's they're not jumping straight into the boiling water. They can't detect that it's happening. They're just slowly being boiled. That's right. That's a scary thought. But uh, let's let's try to make an analogy towards like relationships as well. Like, um, we're talking about the the easier way out and like the the seeking comfort. Um, when it comes to relationships, I feel like a lot of people, uh believe that getting married and like being with somebody is like a safety net do you know what i mean like they're they're going to be yeah. like warm and safe once they get married like they're going to be with that person forever and that's like been settled you know what i mean like i i talked to one of my friends when he got married he was like 21 years old got married and he and i was like why 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 did you do that like, why do you want to get that's married so the, young? That's and what society and the, 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 the Hollywood movies and stuff told him was a good idea, right? Well, what he said to me, and I can't disagree with this more, and I, like, I've always thought about this, is like, he said, um, well, that's, my, that's one part of my life that I've got sort, sorted out now. You know, I can think about other things. I don't need to think about relationships anymore. I can just, you know, I've, I'm married. that's a weird way of thinking about it yeah it really blew my mind he's going through life like a checkbox of like tick got that milestone tick got that milestone like live like like, he'll he'll always be living for something else you know what i mean like what's the next thing what's the next thing and he'll be he'll be 50 60 and wondering what's the next thing oh now well now i'm supposed to live my life and retire and have a good time it's like now you could do that the entire time motherfucker I, I was I think about it like the whole comfort thing, like he just he wants to have that like aspect like he he's he wants to be comfortable, you know, he doesn't want the the discomfort of being single and like having a hard time dating and stuff. He just wants to have that sorted, you know, so that he can move forward and it's like that that sort of like com- that comfort <sighs> that- is is an illusionary fake comfort. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. like that that the relationship isn't like sorted when you get married. That's the beginning of a different That's the stage. Beginning of something. The yeah, different stage you, of the relationship. It's and you're yeah. building something with someone. That's like a day to day thing. That's not like a you, you know one and done. You get married, bish bash bosh. Different 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 things to worry about like that's you're 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 building a partnership you're building a life with someone i mean if i I hope he is treating that with some sense of reverence and seriousness because that's a lot of responsibility and like you need both people working together as well and having good communication this is it's a lot it's not like something that's easy and and it's also you'd you'd want to have arguments and work on your ability to like communicate better and figure things out and 
argue in a way that's not point scoring. So you're not just trying to like beat your partner with your point. You're actually trying to like help them make their points as well because you want to figure it out, not just like make them feel bad because you got to live with this person. You don't want them to be bitter and resentful of you. You want to work together on shit. Mm -hmm. And it's tough to learn how to do that when you're 21, by the way. <laughs> That's almost. Tough. I would argue that's almost impossible almost. for a twenty-one-year-old male. Yeah. There might be a select few that have the crazy natural emotional gift to be able to do that, but mm -hmm. I'm, I would argue that ninety-nine point seven percent of males are ill-equipped. Ill yeah, it's very hard to figure out that type of thing when you're already in a relationship. It's much easier to do it um, after you've broken up and you learn something. You know, <laughs> it's very hard yeah, to you learn. You have to fail to succeed sometimes, right? Yeah. Yeah, true. Some people get lucky. Some people, like, you know, they have, they're like, they marry their fucking teenage sweetheart or whatever, right? Mm. And they, like, live happily ever after and they met each other when they were kids. I mean, sure, it happens. Mm -hmm. It's not common, but it happens. Yeah. Sometimes the exceptions also prove the rule, though. For the vast majority of us, it's not, not so easy. And the modern dating market is fucking treacherous and disastrous to to deal with so even just finding a partner to settle down with can be challenging and there's a lot of time and investment to vet people you don't even know someone properly you have to like you know be in a close relationship in proximity for like six to 12 months to even figure that person out enough to be able to think is this person i want to spend my life with you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I would argue you shouldn't even like think about it that way like um, should, am I going to spend the rest of my life with this person? Because well, there's long-term relationship. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. after a year, I would say you should better start to make your mind up. Do I want to be in a long-term relationship or not after a year of being together? Yeah. That's when the true colors start to come out a bit more. I feel like a lot of people get like a uh, choice anxiety or something like that when they're, um, deciding who they're going to get married with. Like some, some people, they just hop right in. They're just like, they just go for it even when they really shouldn't, you know, even if they just ignore the red flags, but other people, they like mm. have like kind of like choice anxiety where oh. they just can't, they're like, I, I can't pick someone to live with the rest of my life. You know, it's such a hard decision. <laughs> like, what about I've, this thing? What about that thing? Like, I have no idea, but you just, you just don't know what it's going to be like in the future. You don't know what you're going to be like. You be don't know what they're going to be like. <laughs> it's, to be, to be fair, though, I, I have heard the argument that in a way you want a little bit of red flags because what you mm. want is something to trigger arguments early on so that you can build being able to communicate and figure shit out. Because mm. if you have too much of a good relationship where you just don't argue for like a whole year or whatever, and eventually a, a real serious problem comes along and you haven't figured out how to argue you haven't figured out how to resolve things in such a way that you don't feel bitter and resentful towards each other mm -hmm. you could just be fucked at the first major life hurdle that gets thrown your way as a couple because right. you didn't argue and figure this shit out so in a way i've heard the argument that uh, most successful relationships started with red flags mm. in the early stage not necessarily like red flags that you know I'm not saying like you should put up with an uh, with like the, a Soviet Union of red flags no matter what. <laughs> Obviously, you you know there there should be a fucking limit and someone should respect your boundaries and what have you. But the reality is is like there's give and take. Not everyone's fucking perfect. And yeah, you you, you might find someone that not necessarily is going to be ideal for you. But maybe you could, even though there are those initial red flags, you can build something to disperse that and by arguing and communicating you can uh mitigate those red flags and you know solve them early on well what i would tell somebody is that you need to figure out your non-negotiable factors like um if there's things in your life that you really want to do like for example if you really want to have kids or you really want to travel you know and you meet somebody who uh is like the opposite opinion of you in those regards and those are red flags like you can't ignore certain red flags yeah. you can't ignore and those yeah. those non-negotiable things are the red flags that you must not ignore because if you, those are your life goals those are things that you really want to do and they don't want to do those things eventually that's going to eat you up if you yeah, don't do those things you know what i mean that you need that you need to do um yeah or it's going to eat them up if they change to what you're doing. You know what I mean? What you want to do. Um, yeah, yeah, I think you need to still have your own self-interest at heart. And if, if there is a miss, if, if the red flags are such a misalignment that it 
you know, kind of intervenes with what you actually want out of a relationship or your own life, then yeah, you can't go down that route unless you can actually solve the red flag and be like, I'm not cool with this and this is how it's going to be. And if not, then bye. And you can somehow navigate that already from the get go. Yeah, you obviously do have to have your non negotiables and have your strong, hard red line boundaries. And once they cross the boundaries, be like, all right, that's it. Well, any anybody who's out there that is looking for advice, I'm sure <laughs> not many, but from me, I would say that um, you find out those non-negotiables really fast and you talk to that person about, you know, if you, you meet somebody, um, you discuss your non-negotiables with them right away because if they, uh, you know, fall in love with you and they really care about you, they might be willing to uh, bend those mm-hmm. rules even if you're not. And then they might be the one getting eaten up inside, you know, 10 years down the line um, because they changed what they wanted so that they could be with right. you. You know what I mean? So if you get and it out of the way. Some people don't want to be alone. Yeah. So they'll, they'll think that they want that. They'll think that like, oh, it's okay for me not to rock the boat just mm. so that I can not be alone. They're not actually thinking of it in these conscious terms. This is happening all subconsciously, obviously. But yeah, they're thinking to themselves subconsciously, I don't want to rock the boat. I want to stay in this because I don't want to be alone. Yeah, And then that might work for a month or a year or three years or five years, whatever. But eventually you will be bitter. You'll be resentful. You'll be unfulfilled. You'll be unhappy. It'll eat away at your soul given enough time and it's not going to have... The, the desired result and you mm-hmm. will probably still be alone eventually you'll be more damaged than alone though mm-hmm. is the problem and you would have wasted that time mm-hmm. when you could have found someone that really does fulfill you or find a life situation that really does fulfill you well Sean, i always say it's not wasted time if you learn something right true <clears throat> true so some people have uh have to learn things the harder way do you know what i saw a really crazy video Mm -hmm. i felt bad laughing at it a little bit but it was a video of like um i'm not sure if it was her dad or whatnot or just a boxing instructor but it was like a a a, a big geezer coaching a young female she can't have been i don't know i'm really bad at assessing ages I, i guess somewhere between like 12 and 14 or something i don't fucking know um and and he's teaching her how to box and he's like teaching her to keep her her hands up right Mm -hmm. and 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 after she throws the punches she goes to put her right arm up but she doesn't cover her face with her right arm and he keeps stepping forward to correct her to like lift up her right arm again so that her fist is you know covering her right cheek and each time she throws the combo she doesn't put her arm back up high enough and he corrects her like two times on the third time he kind of like stops and like thinks for a second and then he just clops her with his left and actually just like you know with, with a padded he's not like you know hitting it with his bare hand he's got like pads on right so he hits her with the pad and like sends her flying to the floor and the caption is like some people only learn the hard way mm, yeah he even pause to give her a second to to put the yeah. hand up yeah and she didn't so he was like right she's not learning through the the, the instruction of me telling her and pushing her arm up each time she won't learn that way she has to learn the hard way right. she has to see why you put that arm up right something's not something's not connecting in the brain yeah the i think some people missing. are just genuinely like that mm. maybe maybe gotta learn the hard way shin you you prefer yeah. the easy way <laughs> i like a little bit of everything sometimes i'll choose the hard way just because it's more interesting you know what i mean <laughs> Well, uh, I, I often talk about my cousin, but um, my cousin learned the hard way. And um, one thing he told me after he got divorced was uh, that not, not to ignore the, the small things that annoy you, like the little red flags that you were talking about before. He told me not to, oh. not to ignore those things because he said that after 20 years, those small things that annoyed you a little bit, but you thought maybe they were kind of cute or like, just kind of quirky or whatever, those things will make you want to fucking punch the other person in the face. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like maybe you thought like, oh, uh, she, you know, leaves her clothes on the floor or something like that. Or, you know, she forgets this thing. Like, yeah, it might like, yeah. make you roll your eyes and be like, oh, <laughs> oh you. You. You, know, like, you. you might find it a bit endearing for yeah. the first few years. And after living with them for Ten like 20 years, years you're like, yeah. pick up the fucking clothes, woman. <laughs> 
Yeah, exactly. So that was his advice to me after getting divorced, um, like 15 years uh, marriage. So I don't know. It's it's an impossible task. Like I was saying before, like, oh, let me pick somebody to be with for the rest of my life. Oh, dude, it's, it's like it's like when you're 18, uh, go ahead and pick the career that you want to have for the rest of your life. It's like, dude, how the fuck are you supposed to know what you're going <laughs> to like in 30 years? You know what I mean? Like, it's so it's so yeah. hard. I so, mean, yeah, I, I see myself as a totally different person, even just like five, ten years ago. You know, I mean, now, yeah. like, yeah, I can't even imagine. Can't even imagine what I'd be like in twenty, thirty years. Can't even fucking imagine. Yeah, I could, I could guess, but I'd probably be off. Probably you won't be as different as you were twenty years ago. You know what I mean? Um, maybe like the, the oh yeah, because back then the, I was like a teenager, mm, like early teenager. The difference, the difference is get smaller i think as you get older but they Probably still right happen yeah there's still differences that's why it's great i think it's better to wait a little bit longer like the difference but between I dead, right i could be radically different yeah like you know or i could be living in a different country or like yeah the the difference between when you're 18 and when you're uh like the difference between um 18 to 30 and 30 to 40 like it's just insanely different or 20 to 30 and 30 to 40 i think like the change the amount of change you undergo from 20 to 30 is massively more than 30 to 40 do you know what i mean so yeah, you're probably right i mean if waiting a little bit longer to uh make big decisions like who you're going to be with for the rest of your life i think it's a good plan honestly I and think to be fair there's some solid argument yeah, some argument for males especially that is, if anything it's better to just focus on yourself for those mm. early 20s both for life experience and also to like build yourself as a person so you're yeah. able to provide more both emotionally and with actual resources and what have you so then your your own sexual market value shoots up mm -hmm. actually when you get to like 30 and you've got your shit together then you're probably able to still date those 23 year old girls you know what i mean mm -hmm. and still maybe maybe marry one of them if that's what you're into, I guess. Yeah. Go for it. I am. I'm not necessarily saying I would do that, but I, I, I'm not going to necessarily say they shouldn't do it either. <laughs> not saying that I'm not into that. <laughs> not saying that I'm not into that. Yeah. I haven't got my lawyer present. I'll be careful what I say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, watch out. <clears throat> no, we're not. Um... We're not I was into just... checking our speech too much. We're not. We're not no, no, too no. Careful. I mean, I'm. I have been the opposite though. In most of my life, mm. I've. I when I grew up, I was always with older women. I think when when I was like twenty three, I was like dating thirty plus. Like I don't know why, but I was always into older, mature women when I was younger. I don't know if that's because of like their experience and like me preferring someone more mature and like more sexually capable. Maybe that was the angle, but I don't actually know for sure. Mm. So what was your first girlfriend like? Shin, tell tell us a story. Wait, my first girlfriend? Well yeah. okay, define girlfriend. Are we talking like first girlfriend like that i slept with sure. or like okay Start shit there. um <laughs> okay first girlfriend that i actually slept with mm. would be a swedish girl mm. who was a game designer and she i was 16 she was 18 when we met online because she was in sweden mm. um she ended up moving over to live with me a little bit later i lived with her for about a year mm. uh what what would you mean to tell you about it? <laughs> what do you want to know? Wow, how the hell does that happen, man? You met her on what? On StarCraft? No, you met her on. No, oh, okay, so what? I met her. You were, you right, were so I, This was back when I. This was back when I was a competitive Team Fortress Two player, oh. and I was um, on. I was trialing out for TLR at the time, the last resort, and I was smashing four uh, four kings as team in tryouts in stuff like that and she liked me because i was good at the game and she <laughs> played the game 
Mm-hmm. And so she was a bit of a fan girl. So um, she ended up like wanting to play with me and we were talking on Ventrilo and she was like being my medic and I was being soldier in like Publix. And I was just like dominating entire servers with her being my dedicated medic. And it was just hilarious how easy the game is when you've got like a dedicated medic up your ass and you know how to play the game. Mm. So yeah, I had fun doing that with her. And then we got pretty into each other pretty quick. So we were doing like, but this was, this was at a time where I was like quite polyamorous. So I actually had another girl I was into and I had kind of had like a freeway relationship online between these two girls where they were both aware of each other. And we were doing like freeway webcam sex sessions, <laughs> but I eventually chose the Swedish girl and she, I saw they both flew over to see me individually, not at the same time. But um, the Swedish girl was the one that actually ended up moving in with me, and I got into an actual relationship with her. This guy, he hasn't even had sex yet. He's already talking about polyamory. <laughs> yeah, that's the funny thing is I didn't even realize that like that was a term back then, but I did have technically two girlfriends at one time. I knew about each other <laughs> and happy about it. So you guys even mo- a thing. I was a trendsetter. <laughs> Woo! So you, you guys moved in together, and then when did the problem start to set in? Uh, it was all like WoW of Warcraft, actually. Like the entire relationship, I wouldn't let her play WoW because she had gaming. She had a, a very addictive personality about that oh. game in the past, and uh, I was being alpha male about it and being like, "No, you're not playing that game." Mm. Um, and basically, towards the end of the relationship was when I finally like lit up and was like, "Yeah, you can play WoW." And then, like after she started playing WoW again, like it took like. <laughs> two weeks to see big issues and about six to eight weeks for like major deterioration and then yeah like ended the relationship she tried to continue the relationship after she moved back to sweden she still wanted to be together but i was like pretty done with it at that point i talked to her a few times in the future like she'd occasionally hit me up for like sexual shit but like i never really got back together with her after that mm. sounds like me and manor lords men just got into that game and everything just went downhill <laughs> oh my gosh. started playing that game so much i recommend some good games right mm, yeah it's a great game by the way guys if you haven't played it yet manor lords it's like over like, you've heard of overlords but manor lords is the new thing yeah i mean i think i didn't actually know this but it's it's now the i just recently found out it's the number one wish listed game on steam above hades 2 at, at the number two spot which is kind of crazy to get that title from a, a, it's a, a single developer that's been working on this game for like seven or so years it's just recently come out like a month or so ago in early access and he's already done like pretty significant crazy patches that like really warm my heart to see an indie developer without even having a team behind him have this much of a success and still be able to put out good patches and also also temper expectations like he's putting out posts saying stuff like guys this isn't trying to be a total war competitor i'm gonna always stick true to like historical accuracy i'm not gonna like do anything super crazy here like Mm -hmm. he's tempering expectations a lot and like pretty much everything that i've seen so far i really like commend and because of that, I hope they see a lot of success and, you know. Yeah, it's a fun city builder. Pretty interesting. It kind of reminds me of, like, Stronghold or something like that. I hope they get to right. those sort of levels where uh, you can build up, like, walls and all kinds of battlements and defenses and there's, like, siege weapons yeah. and stuff. But it's not really at that level right now. It's mostly just, like, medieval city building basically well, the, you, you can build a few walls and towers with the manor mm-hmm. has like a you can build like a small kind of castle yeah thing but you can't like build anything too significant yeah but to be fair in in terms of historical accuracy mm-hmm. it was very rare that you'd have like a town with like massive walls around it it, mm-hmm. it was the opposite you'd have a smaller inner keep You'd have maybe like a like a palisade or something going around the entire town, but like yeah. the actual main keep itself would be like its own little fortification inside, right. you know. Right. And uh, yeah, it would just be like the king has like a main castle and uh, uh, you know, large town with large battlements and everything. Um, yeah. It, you're kind of playing as more like a an outlying lord on the edge of the realm, you know slowly building up a, a base and everything 
um, taking yeah. over territory and like setting up trading posts and stuff. Yeah. It's cool because yeah, you, it's it's got like a family system. So you start off with five families per settlement, and you got like a few supplies to work with. And you, very quickly, you realize, oh, this is some serious stuff. Like immediately, you're faced with homelessness issue because as you start, you don't have any houses. So immediately, you got to quickly get these guys into houses, or their approval rating will start to go down. In which case, you will no longer attract new families to that region. So very quickly, you can like bottleneck your growth right at the start of the game if you like don't optimize well. So right from the get go, the game is trying to teach you like how important, not necessarily that you're forced to optimize, but just how dire the situations can get and how much management there is. Like it's not like one of those games where it's like you reach a certain threshold and it's like, oh, the game's easy now. Like I, I've got like there's not much more fun in it. It's like no, mm-hmm. if anything, it's the opposite. The bigger your cities get, it's like, hang on a minute, I need to make sure that I'm trading. I've got this region dedicated to farming so I can get enough ale that I can trade it to my other region so that they don't get all unhappy with me because like I've got loads of level three buildings and I need to keep them all like happy in the tavern or whatever. Yeah, the slowly like leveling the buildings and um increases the amount of things that you actually need to have. Like they're they they need like more variety. It's funny on stream. I was talking to somebody, um can't remember who it was now, but uh he was saying like uh so the the, the higher class people need more uh commodities or whatever and like yeah kind of <laughs> yeah. kind of pretty yeah much. <laughs> pretty much <laughs> you, you, you like level you level up the houses so that they can become like artisans and then the artisans require mm-hmm. like a, a more refined diet like they have like a, a larger palate you know they can't just survive on berries and meat they need like bread yep. and <laughs> they need ale yeah, cool. and Ale, yeah. They want, clo- they want different type of clothes, access. churches, yeah, and yeah. Clothes, yeah. <laughs> it is funny. <laughs> Which is realistic. It is realistic. Which I like about it. <laughs> I love the realism in that. And yeah, the family system plays out really nicely. I also like how the the military side of the game works it's not super militaristic there are battles you do recruit troops but you raise militia from your settlements so for example you have to like make sure there's enough spear and shields then you can raise some spear militia or make sure there's enough bows you can raise some you know militia archers and what's cool about that also is that as you level up the buildings they because they are now higher class of people they can have higher class of armor so now you can at level two you can start to give them like helmets and like um padded armor gambazons and uh, at the level three you can start to give them like chain mail and stuff and Mm -hmm. so you can also upgrade their armaments based on their class within the city as well which is really interesting because it's it's kind of it was like that in roman times where um based on your individual wealth was what equipment you could actually bring to the Mm -hmm. table when you're a because you were you were individually as a Roman citizen responsible for your own armor and arms. Yeah. So you're you're like the money that you have as a lord is different from the money that the people in the town have. Right. So like you you control what's happening with the people in the town and where they're spending their money and stuff, but the individuals in the town are buying goods from the market and they buy their own um you know, swords and shields and stuff, and they keep them in their houses. And then when you raise an army, all of the men from the town come out of their houses with their shields and swords, uh, you know, equipped and their, yeah. their armor equipped. And they like walk out their backyard and go into the bat into the field of battle and like, and fight against whatever brigands or something. And they can die. Yeah. And they die. And, um, it like removes the your population you need to like re-raise an army if you have less population it could be harder it's it's crazy yeah. how re- realistic and interesting it is it's a really really fun game yeah it's like families can attract more family members so the man right. can die off but still another family member can move in and take his spot but yeah like that guy physically exists in your village physically has weapons in his house goes in puts on the armor gets the weapons goes out can die and be replaced eventually maybe and while he's out you know fighting he's not at home working so a lot of your infrastructure kind of slows down a lot while you are raising your armies it's so beautiful how realistic that they're implementing everything into the game i really do like it so far yeah it's very fun and addicting it's it's really enjoyable to like it, it it hits that like little nerve that I have for StarCraft where like the economy is rolling correctly. 
You know what I mean? Mm. But there's always like things that are getting out of order and you're like constantly pushing yeah. them back into order to like get things rolling in a straight line to where you want to be. You're constantly, you know, touching the edges and like moving things in the right direction. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it hits that like that little nerve for me. And I really enjoy yeah, it. A lot. A, it hits that sweet spot between, between like planning and being strategic, but mm -hmm. also like that real time strategy element is there yeah and it has that feel of like it's alive it's happening now mm -hmm. and w when there's combat even that that's it's still focused on that real time so it's, it does feel a little bit like total war or something but the overall game i would say is something more akin to back in the day like caesar 3 mm -hmm. so even though it has these kind of elements tied in to other games it's not trying to compete even the dev said himself he's not trying to compete with the total war series it's its own thing completely yeah, it's really, really fun. I'm enjoying it a lot, and uh, I've been streaming it a bunch recently. Um, we'll get back to StarCraft streaming again, but I'm uh, I'm kind of into this right now, and I, th I think this is the type of game where I will play it out for, you know, several weeks and just, like, really enjoy it, and then I'll, like, put it away and come back to it in, like, a year yeah. and see what the devs have been making for, you know, how they've progressed and... That's what's um, exciting about it, right? Yeah. Is that we'll see crazy improvements as time progresses as well. I hope I hope we do. I hope he continues to go on. It seems like he will, but you never know. Things can yeah. things happen. And when it's a one man job, like there's only one guy working on this, what happens if that something happens to that guy? <laughs> like what if he gets sick? <laughs> or what if he dies or something? It's like, dude, that's um that I would mean, be a bummer. <laughs> that would be a huge bummer. Well, he's yeah, at the moment he's making the games industry look pretty bad though, and I, I, I and I'm all about that. I'm all about mm. like the power of the indie devs to be able to show that there's a big problem because that's what they're doing. They're telegraphing what everyone's thinking. You know, mm -hmm. it's a physical embodiment of what the issues are in the gaming industry right now. Is that there's too much like quantity over quality focus, and the devs don't actually care enough about ga games anymore. It's all so focused on how can we make the most amount of money with the least amount of effort kind of way of thinking too much right and it's always copying previous trends of like what like oh like these games did well so therefore our game needs to be a live service game and this way of thinking is just like hampering good game development yeah trying to figure out what's the formula like they're trying to perfect the yeah. formula when they should be like allowing creativity to flour flourish but right um, this is a proof positive for Unreal Engine, right? Unre this is all made in Unreal, and it's yeah. made by one guy. It's like okay, it's well, beautiful. with the tools that are available now, it's so much, it's so within reach to build an amazing game like this. You know what I mean? It's not like and, and a, a hundred million dollar, uh, thing that ha like a, only a massive company can undertake. Like, no, you can actually make this. Yeah. Shit. And now wait until the AI is just a little bit more developed, and in a few years' time, the AI can help you develop the game as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's and you've right. got an AI working alongside you to like make up for the fact that you haven't got a whole team behind you. You've now got an AI that's helping you code and helping you do all kinds of shit. Right, you're just prompting it and like mm -hmm. tweaking it, adjusting it, getting it into a spot that you like. Yeah, it's it's exciting. It's very exciting to see. We might have like a crazy flux of like really good games in the future where like because of the more accessibility to those indie devs, we just have such good games coming out and it might force the major publishers and bigger bigger dev teams to actually reconsider and like be like, okay, we need to change our tack too. And then we might see some really good AAA titles as well. Yeah, that would be amazing. Well, guys, uh, we started a little bit late here today, but we're going to have to end a uh, slight bit early so we'll um pick up this conversation in the next episode thank you so much for watching we love you all of you guys who have been commenting uh, there's a few of you out there who are still watching um we appreciate you it's just a small show but putting our passion into it and, and uh having a lot of fun so thanks for coming on again shun thanks for being here yeah thanks for uh starting this thing with me and uh my pleasure I'm excited for KCM finals. That's what we're doing next together. But uh, oh yeah, we'll get into another podcast ep episode next week. Yeah, sounds good. Well, guys, stay black. Thanks. We'll see you on the next one. <laughs> okay. Bye.